Dead America, Seattle, Part 4 Dead America, The Northwest Invasion, Book 6 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day 0, Plus 24 What do you think, Jinx? Private Davila asked, leaning on the railing overlooking the main cargo hold. This the day we're finally getting off this boat? Corporal Eddie Jinx Jenkins tongued his cheek. That's the rumor going around, he replied. Of course, we've heard similar rumors for the last two weeks. He tilted his head, voice rising in pitch as he mocked. Oh, we're getting off in Portland. Oh, we're headed for Hawaii. Oh, look, it's Fantasy Island. I can't wait to party with that midget dude. Tattoo, Davila offered. Jinx raised an eyebrow. Tattoo? Yeah, that was the dude's name, Tattoo, the private explained. He would always yell, De plane, de plane. How do you not know that? Jinx rolled his eyes. How do I not know the name of a specific character from a 70s TV series? He put a hand to his chest in mock offense. I don't know. Could be because I had a life before the end of the world? Better question is, how do you know the character name? What next? You going to rattle off the crew of the love boat? Well, there was Captain Stubbing, Dr. Bricker, Isaac the bartender, Davila replied, counting off on his fingers. The corporal chuckled, shaking his head. Buddy, I'm going to tell you something that someone should have told you years ago, he said, clapping his friend on the shoulder. You really need to get out more. Nah, it's not like that, man, Davila replied, sharing the laugh. I spent summers with my grandmother, and she loved those old 70s shows. Had stacks of VHS tapes and would watch them over and over again. Even still had the commercials on them. I was so heartbroken as a kid when I found out I couldn't get new coke. Jinx grinned. From what I understand, you dodged a bullet there. Yeah, no kidding, the private agreed. The loudspeaker in the cargo hold flicked on with a light squeal and fumbling mic noises before a booming voice echoed in the room. Attention, all team leaders. Please report to the briefing room, it said. Repeat. All team leaders, please report to the briefing room. Well, looks like the rumors were true, Jinx said, stretching his arms above his head. Davila grinned. Make sure you get us a good assignment, he said, pointing a finger at his corporal. None of this guarding a gas station nonsense. We've traveled this far, and we're ready to light these things up. You know it, Jinx winked at him and then exchanged a fist bump. Get the squad together at our usual table in the mess hall, and I'll brief you when I'm done. He headed off towards the briefing room, glancing down at the floor below to see a few dozen men doing the same thing. This is going to be a packed room, he thought. Guess everybody is chomping at the bit to get off of this boat. Jinx worked his way down the narrow hallways of the ship, glancing in every room he passed to see them overcrowded with people and gear. When they'd left port nearly a month ago, there wasn't much time to load things like normal, which meant vital goods like guns, ammo, and food had been thrown anywhere and everywhere they could. The USS Anchorage, a San Antonio-class transport ship, was state-of-the-art, designed to carry all manner of man and machinery into battle. It was complete with a helicopter landing pad on the surface and a battery of weaponry that would put most other nations' navy ships to shame. Today, however, in the midst of the zombie apocalypse, the ship was vastly different. Instead of cargo holds filled with tanks and vehicles, it housed nearly a thousand soldiers on makeshift bedding. This effectively doubled the intended capacity for the ship, putting a strain on everything from the mess hall to simple things like plumbing. The close quarters and constant deployment at sea had begun to take its toll on the soldiers, with numerous fisticuffs breaking out over the previous week. The stress of not knowing when they would get off made it even worse, coupled with the worries that what they would be facing was too much for them to bear. Jinx, however, was not one of those soldiers. He was known for a wild streak, and had gotten his nickname from his luck that bordered on the supernatural with how many times he'd escaped death in the field. He was itching to get off of this damn boat and dive headfirst into action. 
He reached the briefing room, and it was already beginning to get crowded. About forty soldiers had squeezed into a room where twenty would have normally fit comfortably. Jinx looked behind him and spotted a handful of soldiers still working their way down the hallway. Yo, man, let me slip by you real quick, he murmured, and when one of the men in the back turned towards him, he used the opening to slide in and work his way to the front of the room. He found a corner on the front row and knelt down beside the side door. A few moments later, the door opened and Captain Odom entered the room. He was an older man, easily in his late forties, with rapidly graying hair. The men all stood at attention in his presence, but he waved them off. Everybody gets settled. There's a lot to go over, he declared. Another soldier entered through the door carrying a large printed satellite image tacked to a corkboard. He set it up besides the captain so that the room could see. It was focused on a bay just off the ocean. Some of you have no doubt heard the rumors that our assault on Seattle began yesterday, Odom began, and I can confirm those rumors are true. Multiple strike forces attacking numerous points on the north and eastern parts of the target launched operations just before dawn yesterday. They have been fighting throughout the day and have been making some progress against the enemy. Now, while the rest of our ships have been moving to the north to assist in the assault on downtown, we have been held back for a special mission. He looked around at the corkboard and found a thin pointer nestled in the bottom tray. He held it up and began pointing to different spots on the map as he spoke. This is North Bay, roughly fifty miles west of Olympia, he continued, which is our ultimate target. For those of you unfamiliar with the layout of the Seattle metro area, Olympia is to the southwest, and is the last pocket of major civilization. Our mission is to land and push forward towards Olympia to create another front for the enemy to fight us on. It's our job to distract as many as we can so that the ground forces can march in from the east. He snapped the pointer against the area just to the north and east of the bay. Before we can do that, however— he continued. We have to pacify the town of Aberdeen. As you can see, the bulk of the town is situated between three rivers, the main one running along the southern border and two smaller ones to the east and west. Our landing point is going to be to the harbor on the northwest of town, less than a quarter mile from a non-insignificant population area to the west of the river. A hand shot up in the middle of the room and the captain sighed, reluctantly pointing to it. Sir, we have no landing craft on board, the soldier called. How are we going to get ashore? Odom clucked his tongue. I'm getting to that, soldier, he said impatiently. We have orders from the top of the food chain to beach the ship on shore so we can rappel down the side. The stunned silence in the room was so pregnant, it was as if the soldiers weren't even breathing. Believe me when I say that I share every thought currently running through your heads the captain said firmly. I even went so far as to share some of them with the general, who politely informed me that the enemy didn't have a navy, so the mission is more important than the survival of our ship. Murmurs broke out amongst the soldiers, some of them nodding, few still wide-eyed. Moving on, Odom said loudly, commanding attention once again. Upon landing, we will be forced to rappel down the side of the ship. Thanks to the great resource purge, we will have only four lines coming down from the deck, so it's going to be a long process to get people to the shore, and with the noise we're going to be making, we're going to have quite the crowd before we're ready. This area had around 20,000 people, so we are expecting a stiff resistance. To protect us from being overrun, I need three teams to volunteer for diversion duty. He paused, raising his chin. I'm asking for volunteers because the likelihood of survival is... low. Jinx's hand shot up into the air before anybody else, and Odom raised an eyebrow at him. Oh, hell. Is that Jinx? Somebody called from the back. Gonna be a wild ride if it is. Laughter rippled through the men, but Odom didn't react. Simply scanned the room for more volunteers. A few moments later, two more hands reluctantly went up, and the captain nodded. Okay, that's our three, he declared. Need you to stay behind, 
The rest of you get your teams together and see my assistant on the way out for your landing assignments. The soldiers began to filter out, varying noise levels of chatter as they went. Corporal Spence and Sergeant Dickerson approached the front of the room. Yeah, I thought that was you, Dickerson said with a lopsided grin as he stepped up next to Jinx. Odom cocked his head. You two know each other, Sergeant? Oh, yes, sir, Dickerson replied. Corporal Jinx and I go back a ways. Had a few misadventures in the sandbox. The captain raised his chin. Is this going to be a problem? Oh, not at all, Captain, the sergeant assured him, raising his palms. The corporal and I get along real well. In fact, I'm kind of relieved to know he's on this suicide mission. Odom clucked his tongue. Oh, yeah? he asked. And why is that? Because the only way he could be any luckier is if he shoved a rabbit's foot in places best left to the imagination, Dickerson replied. The captain gaped at the soldiers, shaking his head. Luck? he asked. You're excited to have him along because he's lucky? He blinked and then turned to Jinx. So, you're lucky, huh? In a single tour, my team and I walked away from four IEDs, a dozen ambushes, and a whole host of other situations that have since been erased thanks to the hard work of bourbon destroying those brain cells, the corporal declared proudly. Odom clucked his tongue again. Lucky indeed, he replied dryly. Let's hope that keeps up. He motioned for the trio to cluster around the map. He removed the top sheet to reveal a tighter shot of the city of Aberdeen. He used the pointer to motion to the area on the west side of the bridge. Once you're on the ground, you need to push forward across this area, he said. It's ten blocks of mostly residential housing leading up to the bridge. Once you're across is when the real fun begins, he motioned to the north. This area to the north is a shopping center that should provide cover to draw the enemy up there. Odom pointed to a specific spot in the south by a river. Same thing with this spot in the south. I need a team to go to each one, set up a diversion, and hold the enemy's attention while we get a foothold. Sir, my team can take the southern target, Spence piped up. Dickerson nodded. My team will take the northern target. The captain turned to Jinx. Then that leaves you with the big job, he pointed to a shopping center on the far east of town, practically on its own little island with two bridges leading across to it. Corporal, your team will have three primary goals. The first is to get to the target and draw as many of those things as you can. The second is to escape via the river within a stone's throw of the building, circle back, and block off the bridges with whatever you can find. And the third is to cause as much havoc on the way there as you can. Set up traps, set things on fire, whatever you need to do to distract the enemy and eliminate them. Jinx nodded. My team and I can handle that, sir, he said, and then raised a finger. But I do have a question. Go for it, Odom said. If we're blocking off the bridge on the east side of town to trap these things, the corporal began, then why don't we just block off the bridge into Aberdeen and call it a day? The captain took a deep breath. We considered that, he admitted. But with the amount of enemy forces in town, the higher-ups felt like we could end up in a surge situation. If the barricade failed, our landing zone would be overrun, and there would be little we can do about it. That works for me, Jinx replied with a nod. Like a lot of the soldiers on this ship, my team and I are ready to get into the action. A lot more fun rampaging through the streets than babysitting a barricade. Odom raised his chin. Well, Corporal, you and your team have free reign to do whatever you deem necessary, he declared. This isn't a strategic target, so once we clear it, it's unlikely anybody is going to be back here for quite some time. Burn the city to the ground. Got it, Jinx replied with a playful smirk. The soldiers chuckled, and Odom shook his head. Not sure I would go that far, he replied with a playful shrug. But if it comes to it, then it comes to it. Now, go brief your teams and get ready to move. We're grounding this ship in thirty, and your teams are the first over. Yes, sir, the soldiers replied in unison as the captain headed out of the room. Dickerson smacked Jinx on the shoulder. You ready to get after it? Just another walk in the park, 
the corporal replied with a smirk. What channel are you going to be on? the sergeant asked. Jinx winked at him. Lucky number thirteen, as always. Same as it ever was, Dickerson replied, chuckling and shaking his head. You give me a call if you need a hand. The corporal nodded. Likewise, he said, and then turned to Spence. Same goes for you. We're running headlong into the shit. We got each other and not much else for a while. See you two topside in thirty, Spence replied with a firm nod, and the three men exited the room, splitting off to seek out their respective teams. Chapter 2 Jinx entered the mess hall, which was crowded as usual. Soldiers were everywhere, trying to get whatever bits of food and drink they could before it ran out. Rationing had been going strong since they'd set food on the ship, but even with that, food was beginning to run out. "'Hey, Jinx, over here!' Davila called out, waving his hand in the air. The corporal approached the table, giving a nod to the shorter Latino soldier. "'Hope you are getting your rations in, because we're about to go raise some hell,' he declared. "'Do tell, corporal!' Private Stein drawled, leaning his broad shoulders forward. Jinx took a seat. "'Oh, just the normal shit. Storm the beachhead and distract the enemy so the bulk of the force can get a foothold,' he said. Private Birch's eyes widened. "'Beachhead?' he asked. "'What are we doing, swimming to shore?' The corporal shook his head with a devious smile. "'Nope.' he replied. We're crashing the ship right onto shore. Private Jarvis furrowed her brow. Have I been in a coma? she asked, pointing her fork at him. Because I totally missed when we promoted you to captain. Jinx barked a laugh. Surprisingly enough, it wasn't my idea. He put up his hands in surrender. I mean, let's be honest, if it was, there would be more explosions. This is true, Jarvis agreed. So, is that all we're doing, is running around blowing shit up? Private Rollins asked, the fluorescent lights shining off his dark, bald head. You say that like there's anything else to do in life, Birch quipped. Rollins shrugged. I mean, I can work with it, but it would be nice to have a solid objective, he admitted. Don't worry, we got one, Jinx assured him. Long story short is that we have to get to the other side of town pull a whole mess of zombies across some bridges, and then block them off. Nothing we haven't done before. Jarvis shook her head. Again, coma, she said. When in the hell did we lure zombies somewhere? How many men have you lured back from the bar in your day, Jarvis? Davila asked innocently. She shot him a sheepish smile. I withdraw the question. The table erupted in laughter and Jinx got to his feet. Where you off to, Corporal? Birch asked. His superior inclined his head to the door. Going to see if I can procure us some extra provisions, he explained. As for you five, finish up, grab your gear, and be up on deck in twenty. His team nodded, and he headed off to make some last-minute preparations. Chapter 3 Jinx led the group up to the deck, joining the other two teams standing at the top. Odom stood there with them, along with a few other troops who were making preparations on the rappelling lines that were being connected to the railings. Jinx raised an eyebrow at the line, which was made of chain-link. "'Sparing no expense for us, Captain,' he said. "'So much stuff was cast overboard to make room for more soldiers that this is all we could scrounge up,' Odom explained. Four chains!' The corporal raised a fist. "'Don't worry, Captain.' he said firmly. We'll buy you all the time you need to unload. That's what I'm counting on, he replied. The soldier by the railing made the final check before turning and giving him the thumbs up. Looks like we're good to go here, Odom said. Jinx nodded. We're ready to rock and roll too. The captain nodded and pulled out his walkie-talkie, raising it to his mouth. We are ready to go up here, he said. Yes, sir. Moving out, the soldier from the bridge replied. Odom put the radio away and turned to face the three groups, each of them six strong. The boat began to move from position towards the bay entrance. Everybody, listen up, he declared. Just gave the order, so we'll be on shore in a matter of minutes. 
We have a handful of snipers on board, so once we make landfall, they'll be covering your descent. You all have your assignments. He raised his chin. Be safe out there. There was a chorus of, Yes, sir, as the captain headed back inside the ship. Jinx approached the railing and stood next to Stein and Birch, staring out at the bay as it grew closer and closer. What do you say, Jinx? Birch asked. You think we got a chance of pulling this off? The corporal grinned. Yeah, it'll be a walk in the park, he said, spreading his arms. A giant zombie-filled park. You able to find us anything fun? Stein asked. Jinx smirked. Oh yeah, he said. But if I tell you about them, it won't be a surprise. He winked and then headed over to Spence and Dickerson, who were prepping their teams. If you gentlemen don't mind, he said to catch their attention, I'd like my team to be the first over the side. We have the furthest to go, so I'd like to get a jump on it. Fine by me, Spence replied. My team isn't too happy I volunteered them for this, so pretty sure if I made us go first, I'd be in line for a friendly fire incident. Dickerson chuckled. Look forward to following in your carnage-filled footsteps. Come on, Sergeant, that was one time, Jinx drawled, rolling his eyes. Dickerson shook his head. One for me, he corrected. I've heard stories from others who have followed you into battle. What can I say? Jinx replied, puffing out his chest. I take pride in my work. The trio shared a laugh and then exchanged fist bumps. You stay safe out there, he said in a rare moment of seriousness. We'll swap stories on the march to Olympia. Back at you, Dickerson replied. The corporal headed back to his team, all of which stood looking out over the water. The ship was passing through the entrance to the bay and making the turn towards the landing zone. The beachhead was another thousand yards away and closing quick. Okay, we're first over the side, Jinx announced. So as soon as we start moving, get those chains over and start climbing. He looked around. Who has binoculars for me? Rollins reached into his bag, pulling out a pair and handing them over. Jinx looked through them to the beach, seeing several dozen zombies wandering about, some of which were looking towards the beastly ship. Damn, we're going to be coming into a crowd, he muttered. He looked past them at the thick line of trees about a hundred yards behind. It was hard to see, but he spotted movement within the branches. He continued to scan, finally focusing on a small shack at the far end of the beach. Got movement in the trees, too. Any idea how thick the woods are? Birch asked. Jinx tilted his head back and forth. Twenty, thirty yards max, he said. Edge of town is on the other side of it, which is where the real fun begins. If there's this many on the beach, we would be coming in for one hell of a welcoming party, Jarvis said dryly. Jinx nodded. Which means we're going to have to move quick, he said. As soon as your boots hit the sand, make your way to the shack on the far end of the beach. That's the rally point. And the zombies? Rollins asked. The corporal handed back the binoculars. Clear the landing zone for the other teams and let the snipers handle the ones coming from the woods, he instructed. We got a double loadout, but 420 rounds is going to go quick. Questions? The team shook their heads, making noises in the negative. Let's get ready to roll, then, Jinx said. The soldiers geared up, loading up their ammunition and gear bags and checking their files. Birch leaned over and looked at the chains, inspecting the thick gauge metal with large chunks welded to it every few yards for handholds. This is some Frankenstein bullshit right here, he muttered. The deck teams lined up on the railing, bracing themselves as the ship hurtled towards the shoreline. As they reached the hundred-yard line, the PA system crackled to life. All hands, brace for impact, the captain bellowed. The ship began to run aground as it approached the shore, hitting the low part of the sea floor. Everyone lurched forward as the momentum quickly stalled. There was a horrific loud sound of metal versus rocks as the ship skidded along the sand. The strike teams rattled around, holding on to the railing. Jinx's eyes were wide, a massive grin on his face as if he were on a roller coaster. A few members of his team looked excited as well, prompting a few of Spencer's team to stare at him with furrowed brows. Jinx flashed them a hand with his pointer, and Pinky Fingers extended in the iconic Devil Horn sign, letting out a whoop. Finally, the ship came to a stop on the shore, 
the front end of the ship about ten yards onto the beach. Chains overboard! Jinx barked, and his team moved fast. The soldiers shoved the heavy chains over the side of the ship. It took two people on each one to get it going, but soon the metal plummeted to the ground below. Jinx looked over the side, all four lines close together, no more than five yards apart, landing on the sand below. One of the chains smacked a zombie on the shoulder, ripping the arm clean off. So close, to Villa! the corporal cried. You almost had a headshot! Davila chuckled and tapped his gun. Don't worry, I'll make up for it. Davila, Jarvis, Rollins, on me, Jinx said. Let's move. He hopped over the railing and grabbed onto the chain as his three teammates did the same. He looked down the forty yards to the ground, watching the dozen zombies directly below them, and a few dozen more on either side of them on the beach, and headed their way. He climbed down quickly, hand over hand with his feet walking down the side, moving faster than his soldiers. When he was about ten yards from the ground, he stopped, looking at the dozen zombies reaching up for him hungrily. Jinx wrapped his off-hand around the chain, enough to support his weight. He pulled his handgun and then opened fire, one by one popping rounds into rotted foreheads, dropping them. A few seconds later, the other three members of his team were level with him, joining in the execution of the ghouls. "'Landing zone is clear,' Jinx said, holstering his gun. "'Move!' The four troops dropped the rest of the way to the ground, quickly finding their footing on the sand and raising their assault rifles. Jarvis, with me, Jinx said, moving his hand in quick flicks of his wrist. Rollins, to Villa, other side. He moved to the left of the ship, taking aim at the twenty or so zombies that moved towards them, the closest five yards away. The duo acted as a single unit, moving forward and executing ghouls with precision, stepping over the fallen corpses to reach the next one in line. The entire firefight was over in a matter of moments, with the two soldiers mowing through the crowd with ease. As Jarvis shot the last remaining zombie in the face at nearly point-blank range, she turned and gave her corporal a high five. Fucked them up, Jinx, she declared. He nodded. Yeah, we did, he agreed with a grin. Lot more waiting on the same treatment. Let's move. They rushed back to the ship as Stein and Birch hit the ground. Let's go, Jinx called. Rally point. The four soldiers moved across the beach, headed towards the old shack at the far end. As they went, they saw a trail of death from Rollins and de Villa who'd cut through the immediate group of zombies. When they spotted the shack fifty yards away, there were several zombies emerging from the woods. As they ran, gunshots boomed from the ship and the zombies began to fall as the backs of their heads exploded. Rollins and de Villa took a knee on the side of the shack as the other four caught up, and the shorter man nodded to the corporal. Off to a good start, de Villa said. Jinx nodded. Yeah, we navigated through your handiwork on the beach, he said. Nice work. So what's next? Rollins asked, keeping watch on their flank. Jinx looked out from behind cover towards the woods, which was about fifty yards away, running for hundreds of yards in both directions. There were dozens of rotted corpses emerging from the trees, and they were starting to make headway to the ship the numbers greater than what the snipers could keep up with. The corporal pulled out a satellite image of the area on their side of the bridge. Bridge is on the south part of town, so let's stick as close to the south as we can, he said, running his finger along the paper. The woods are going to be a bitch with as many of those things, so we need to push through. Rally Point is this wrecker yard looking place. Teams of two, watch each other's backs and let's move. He and Jarvis broke off first, de Villa and Roland shortly after leaving Birch and Stein as the final team. The three mini-teams broke out into the open, spreading out about ten yards apart from each other and racing towards the tree line. There were a few dozen zombies ahead of them, with more coming out of the woodwork as they grew closer. "'Knock them down and keep moving,' Jinx said. The duo reached the first few, who were a few yards apart. Both soldiers lowered their shoulders and rammed into a zombie each, sending the flailing corpses tumbling to the ground. Their presence drew the attention of numerous zombies around them, who quickly changed their target from the ship to them. Jinx and Jarvis made it to the woods, seeing the trees packed full of the dead, but at least broken up thanks to the thick trunks. They darted to the left, hoping to put a little distance between them and the other two teams. The corporal led the way, his partner a few yards behind. He drew his handgun for close encounters, as there were far too many creatures to simply push through. 
He came around a tree, quickly popping a zombie in the head before shoving the lifeless corpse aside. There was a torrent of gunfire coming from the other two teams, and he furrowed his brow in concern, wondering how bad it was on the other side. He had to concentrate on himself, however, as he came around a thick trunk and spotted half a dozen creatures blocking his path. Jarvis! he barked. She stepped up with her assault rifle, peppering the zombie group with some three-round bursts, dropping most of them. The corporal put a bullet in the last remaining creatures for good measure. Five out of six, not bad, he said, and she wrinkled her nose as she followed him deeper into the woods. They avoided the outstretched hands of several ghouls continually drawn to their noise. Soon the daylight at the far end of the woods peeked through to them. Keep pushing, almost there, Jinx said. They took out a few more zombies, making their run a bit easier. They pumped their legs hard, darting around a couple more trees before emerging into a field on the other side of the woods. There were a handful of corpses in the field, but they were spread out fairly well. Looks like the first wave of those things aren't too bad, Jinx mused. Snipers and those other teams should be able to clear them out. He glanced to the right, hoping to see his teammates emerging, but they hadn't yet. Instead, all he heard was more gunfire in the woods. He took a deep breath and then glanced at Jarvis, whose eyes were hard to mask her own concern. They can handle themselves, the corporal assured her. Let's get a move on. Jinx and Jarvis moved briskly across the field, avoiding the spread-out zombies as they went. Soon they hit a road and started moving to the south. A quarter mile later they spotted the driveway to Eddie's scrapyard. Stay alert, he said quietly. Silent kills if possible. Jarvis nodded and slung her rifle over her shoulder, drawing her knife as they jogged down the dirty driveway. As they grew closer to the small building, they spotted numerous broken-down cars stacked up along the side of the road. The sounds of moaning and flesh smacking against metal erupted from the other side of the wall of cars, but it didn't seem as if the creatures could get through. Jinx rushed up to the window of the small dilapidated building that looked like it would collapse if someone punched it in just the right place. He peered inside, seeing a darkened, messy office, but no movement. Let's get inside, he whispered, and turned the knob, but it was locked. He studied the door for a moment, the weathered wood with peeling paint, and then gave it a forceful straight kick. The entire frame shattered, and the door hung open. Knock, knock, he murmured. They stood at the entrance, waiting patiently for something to come out, but nothing did. Just to be safe, they did a quick sweep of the building, finding it empty. See if you can find anything useful, and wait on the others, Jinx instructed. Jarvis raised an eyebrow. Where are you off to? she asked. Going to check and see what's coming up, he replied, and then headed out of the building. He checked the satellite image of the area, noting a short line of trees to the north of the junkyard. On the other side of that was the main residential area that stretched on for several blocks before the bridge. He readied his knife, not wanting to draw attention to himself, and walked through the woods. There were only a couple of zombies milling about, both of whom had become entangled in roots and branches, writhing in anger at being unable to free themselves. They got agitated when they spotted a fresh meal, moaning and thrashing about. "'Was going to let you slide,' the corporal muttered. But "'You had to start making a racket.' He stepped up and executed two swift knife blows, slumping the creatures over in their entangled mess. He cleaned his knife off on one of their shirts before sheathing it. Moans erupted from the other side of the woods, and he moved slowly and silently. He inched to the edge of the trees, stopping about ten yards before exiting, which was close enough to see out without giving up his position. He swallowed hard at the sight of a small army of zombies, easily hundreds of them, closer to a thousand than zero. All of them moved up the street towards the gunfire coming from the ship, faint but still loud enough to attract attention. Shit, he thought bitterly. If this group makes it to the beach, they can forget about gaining a foothold. We're gonna have to do something. Chapter 4 Jinx ran back through the woods, getting to the rally point as Davila and Rollins walked up the driveway. They turned and saw the corporal running towards them, which made them stiffen for a moment before they realized nothing was chasing him. Holy shit, you scared the fuck out of me, Davila said, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. Thought we had a runner. Jinx shook his head, chest heaving. 
It's worse than that, he replied. Come on, let's get to the others. They picked up the pace, reaching the building where the other three members of their team stood waiting. What did you find? Jarvis asked. The corporal took a deep breath. There are a thousand of those things on the other side of the tree line, and they're all headed towards the ship, he said. If we don't distract them, there's no way our guys will get a foothold. Jarvis cocked her head, smiling as she held up a set of keys. It's a good thing I found these, then, she declared, jingling the keys. The boys all shared confused glances, and she smiled even bigger, waving for them to follow her. She led the pack out the back door towards the personal parking lot. As the lot came into view, the soldiers stopped short and stared at the sight. That, Birch gaped, that is a big-ass truck. Standing before them was a souped-up pickup truck with a major lift kit and oversized wheels. It wasn't quite a monster truck like one would see at rallies, but the front bumper was almost four feet off of the ground. It was jet black with tack fire decals running down the side of it from the front wheels. Did we hit a teleporter and end up in Alabama? Stein asked. Birch barked a laugh. You tell us, he said. Do you have the sudden urge to fuck your sister? Nah, wouldn't want your sister to get jealous, Stein shot back. Davila snorted. Please, you couldn't get Birch's sister with a stack full of fifties. Both men paused and stared at their shorter friend. Not sure if you were insulting me or Stein, Birch admitted. Davila shrugged, giving them a sheepish smile. It's the rare two-for-one deal. Jarvis jingled the keys again. If you boys are done, she prompted, which one of you is coming along for the ride? Birch, you're with Jarvis, Jinx said as he pulled out the satellite image again. The soldiers clustered around him to have a look as he pointed to the areas of interest. If you head due north of here, you'll run into the main road, he began. Get up there and start heading towards the water. Look for something to blow up. Lay on the horn the entire time. Shoot, do whatever you can to draw the crowd your way. Davila raised an eyebrow. Where are we headed? The bridge is seven, eight blocks due west of here, Jinx replied. Mostly through residential areas. When that crowd starts moving north, we haul ass towards the bridge. Jarvis nodded. Rally point? she asked. The corporal shook his head. No clue, he admitted. But it'll be on this side of the bridge. We'll be on the lookout for you, so we'll signal when you are getting close. She nodded again and turned to Birch. You want shotgun or in the back? You're not going to let me drive? He asked, putting a hand on his chest in mock offense. Jarvis put a hand on her hip. I've seen you in the shower, and unless you have a boyfriend you aren't telling us about, it's obvious you have no experience handling anything big. She quipped. Now come on. Birch simply shook his head as the others snickered, unable to come up with a viable comeback. He climbed up into the passenger seat as the engine roared to life, rumbling loudly before settling into a nice rhythm. We'll see you at the bridge soon, Jarvis said through the window, and then popped the truck into gear and peeled out. She did an impressive burnout as she drove the behemoth out from the lot and onto the road. Okay, we give them five minutes, then we move, Jink said folding up the map and putting it back in his pocket. In the meantime, we gotta give the other teams a heads up. He pulled out his walkie-talkie. Let's just hope they are in a position to hear it, Davila said. He pointed into the air, signaling the constant stream of gunfire in the distance. Chapter 5 Jarvis drove up to the main road, zombies streaming out from the main part of the neighborhood. Need you to keep your eyes peeled she said. For what? Birch asked. Anything we can use to draw these things away? She replied as she reached the top of the street. She barely paused as she cut the corner tight, and the truck rolled over the edge of the sidewalk, taking out two zombies easily. Jarvis let out a satisfied yell as the creatures flew backwards onto the grass. The main road was littered with ghouls, all moving towards the ship. There were about a hundred or so stretching out several hundred yards, with more coming out from the side streets. She put the pedal to the metal, prompting Birch to hold on to the oh shit handle at the top of the door. This is going to get bumpy, she warned, and began weaving back and forth on the road, cutting a path through the spread out zombies. Bodies flew everywhere, some crushed beneath the gigantic tires, 
There were so many smacks on the vehicle that it sounded like a high school band drum section that was horribly out of sync. Birch looked down every side street as they went, seeing they were fairly packed as well. When they crossed the fourth road, he straightened up. Stop! 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 he yelled. Jarvis slammed on the brake, skidding to a halt and smacking into a few more zombies. What is it? she asked. Back it up! Birch instructed. She threw the truck into reverse and went back until he held up a hand, and they were parallel with the side street. Half a block down, he said, pointing. Down on the left. Jarvis peered past him down the road, and a smile broke out on her face. There was a gas station on the left side, right across from the neighborhood. A few dozen zombies stood between them and the target. She nodded slowly. How much time do you need to light it up? she asked. There's no power, so going to have to use brute force to get into the gas line, Birch replied. Probably some fuel left in the surface line, or I can open up the load valve on the ground and drop something in. Jarvis pursed her lips. Once the gas is out, how long? she asked. Thirty seconds, he replied. Got to set a little bit of a fuse, or else we're going up with it. All right, she replied, and laid on the horn, getting the attention of the ghouls near the station. Any time you want to start shooting, she teased. Birch grabbed his assault rifle and hung out the window, popping off a few rounds towards the station. He aimed at the ground and a car on the side of the road, resulting in some nearby noise for the ghouls. Finally, the bulk of the creatures were heading their way. Jarvis punched the gas and pushed through the crowd that had gathered in front of the truck, taking a few moments to pick up speed. She glanced in the rear view, seeing that only about twenty percent of the horde was following them. She made a hard right turn on the next street, still plowing through zombies on the road. Where are you going? Birch asked. Taking the scenic route to buy you time, she replied, heading up two blocks before turning back towards the station. She circled back onto the road. The diversion had worked somewhat, the bulk of the zombies walking towards the main road. However, about ten ghouls were stubbornly hanging out near the station. Birch readied his weapon, but Jarvis shook her head. Put that away, she said. Your only job is getting the station rigged to blow. I'll cover you. He nodded before pulling out his knife and reached down to grab an old ratty tank top from the floor below. He cut it into a long strand and held it up. Let's do it. Jarvis hit the gas, speeding up the road. As they grew close to the gas station, she swerved, hitting two zombies and sending them flying back onto the road, smacking their heads wetly against the pavement. Move it! she barked. Birch leapt out of the passenger seat, stumbling as he fell the four feet to the ground. He regained his footing and then tore for the fuel pump. Jarvis opened her own door and stood on the step. Come get some, motherfuckers! she yelled and carefully aimed and fired, striking a few zombies in the head and drawing the majority of the others towards her. Two ignored her and shambled towards Birch, so she reached back inside and slammed on the horn. Birch startled, glancing back towards her. She pointed to the two zombies and then tried to pick them off, but it was a difficult shot from the truck at that distance. He waved her off and she nodded, turning back to fending off the rest of the zombies near her. He tried the first pump, tugging at the fuel line and finding nothing. Shit, he muttered. He tried two more, but there was nothing left in the line. He looked around for something heavy, finally seeing a slim metal sign sitting between the pumps. He rushed over and picked it up, using it as a battering ram on the pumps. Jarvis laid on the horn again and he glanced over, the two zombies much closer. He pulled his handgun and quickly dispatched them, and then watched as his partner fired off a few more shots from the truck clearing the immediate threat to them. Birch smashed the pump a few more times before throwing the sign down in frustration with a clatter. What the fuck are you doing? Jarvis yelled. He shook his head and turned to her. The lines are dry, he called back, but if I can get into the pump, the internal lines lead straight down to the main tank. She looked up the road at the hundred or so zombies that had been attracted to their gunfire and headed their way. She looked back at Birch, who had run over to the far side of the parking lot, struggling to undo the metal cap on the refueling tank. Jarvis hesitated for a moment, contemplating her next move. She glanced in the rearview mirror, seeing another large group of zombies headed their way too. Fuck it, she muttered. If it doesn't work, at least it'll be spectacular. She honked the horn a few times, but Birch ignored her, struggling with the cap. 
She backed the back end of the truck up and lined it up with the outermost pump and revved the engine, honking the horn again. Birch didn't break his concentration. She shrugged, giving up and flooring the vehicle in reverse. The tires screeched and the truck sped backwards towards the pump. The back bumper hit in a vicious strike, knocking the pump clear off of the moorings. Gas spewed out, filling the parking lot with flammable liquid. She moved the truck up, vaguely able to hear Birch screaming obscenities as he ran towards the truck, his ranting coming out in an unintelligible fast stream. "'What's that?' she asked, putting a hand to her ear as he jumped into the passenger seat. "'Can't hear you. I was too busy fixing your problem.' Birch shook his head. "'You're a crazy fucking bitch, you know that?' he asked breathlessly. "'Why do you think I fit in with this unit so well?' she asked. All he could do was smirk, knowing she was exactly right. "'So light this puppy and let's get the fuck out of here,' Jarvis said, jerking a thumb over her shoulder. "'We got a lot of company headed our way.' Birch looked up and down the street, noticing the horde coming from both directions. He balled up the shredded tank top and lit it on fire, tossing it out the window. The fireball landed about five yards from the ever-expanding pool of gas. "'Might want to get a move on,' he urged. We don't want to be anywhere near here when that thing goes off. Jarvis peeled out of the parking lot, headed away from the main road towards the smaller pack. As she started to plow through them, there was a gigantic explosion behind them. They checked the rearview mirrors, seeing a fireball engulfed in smoke rise a hundred feet into the air. That ought to get their attention, Jarvis declared. Birch laughed. If Captain Odom asks, it was Jinx's idea, he suggested. She shook her head vehemently. Hell no, she declared. He isn't stealing credit for this one. Chapter 6 Jinx led the group of four through the neighborhood, taking shelter in a house to examine where they were. He studied the map with the villa looking over his shoulder as the other two kept watch out the front and back of the house. Pretty sure we lost that pack, Rollins reported. A couple of them just wandered by and didn't even so much as look our way. Jinx nodded. Good, he replied. Let me know if that changes. He studied the map, tracing his finger along the route they'd taken to get to the house. Did we go five or six blocks? he added. Pretty sure it was five, Davila replied. Okay, that puts us here, the corporal said, pointing. Just a block away from the shopping district and three away from the bridge. Davila nodded. We didn't have that much resistance getting up here, he said, so hopefully the bridge isn't too bad. The gunfire from the ship isn't too present up here, Jinx replied, so hopefully it won't alert too many of them. Davila raised an eyebrow. And if it is? he asked. Then let's hope Jarvis keeps that truck in one piece, the corporal replied, folding up the map and returning it to his pocket. Speaking of them, any idea how we're going to signal them? Davila asked, stepping back as his superior got to his feet. Jinx nodded. I say we get to the shops the next block up and see what we see. Stein, how are we looking on the backside? Davila asked. Yard is clear and haven't seen anything on the next street, came the reply. Could be hiding behind the houses, but none of them have walked by. Jinx checked his weapons. All right, let's get moving, he instructed. We have a half block of houses until the stores. If it's crowded, find the first place with multiple exits we can get into. If it's not, let's find the most useful. He headed for the back door, his team in tow. They readied themselves, doing one last sweep of the yard. Silent, if possible, he said. Light them the fuck up if not. The soldiers nodded as the corporal opened the door and led them out. They rushed through the backyard to the next set of houses by the first row of shops across the street. Jinx paused at the first house and looked out. There were half a dozen standalone shops, none of them in mini mall style buildings. They were mostly a few small consignment shops, all of which were built into existing homes. Ain't this all nice and quaint? Stein murmured. Yeah, just dress up the zombies in formal wear and it can be a real tourist trap, Rollins added. Jinx held up her hand. Come on, let's move up, he said quietly. He led them across the street, moving swiftly so that they didn't draw too much attention to themselves. They sidled up next to one of the businesses, and he noticed one of the zombies had seen them, and wandered towards their position. Rollins, hang back and handle it when it gets here, 
Jinx instructed quietly. Davila, let's see what we're working with. The duo moved to the back side of the building, which butt up against another. They inched their way up to the corner, peering out over the road. There were a few dozen zombies on the roadway and in the parking lots of the businesses. They were spread out well, covering about a hundred yards. Across the street was a large grocery store, and on either side were mini-malls packed full of random stores. What do you think? Grocery store? Davila asked. Jinx shook his head. No, too many of those things around, he murmured. We need to stay mobile. On the right they saw the front edge of the bridge, but the bulk of it was blocked from view by the buildings. Stay here, the corporal said quietly. I'm going to scout the bridge. De Villa nodded as Jinx carefully moved out in front of the building, creeping along the wall as close as he could. He darted down a few buildings before ducking down the alley, taking cover. He scanned the area, happy to note that none of the corpses had taken notice. From this vantage point Jinx could see the bridge, and that it was sparsely populated with zombies, maybe fifty or so running the entire length of the structure. At the far end was the main shopping district and there was a lot of movement down the street, and on the side street running along the bridge. If we can get to the other side we can push through and start causing some trouble, he thought to himself, pleased with what he'd seen. He worked his way back to the others. His footsteps attracted the attention of a few zombies on the road, and they turned, moaning and shambling towards them. Jinx reached the others just as Rollins jammed a knife into the skull of a zombie. De Villa kept an eye on the two that were giving chase to the corporal, relieved that it was only a duo and not more. Stein joined them as Rollins kept watch on the back end. How did it look out there? De Villa asked. Jinx leaned in. Bridge is spread out pretty good, he replied, and the other side has some significant resistance, but I think we can push through. Especially if Jarvis has that truck still purring, Stein added. Jinx nodded. We still need to find a way to signal them. I got that under control, De Villa said and pointed to a small firework stand off to the side of the parking lot. Get their attention, and give us some more firepower. The corporal grinned. I like it. All of a sudden, a gigantic explosion in the distance rattled the windows of the buildings beside them. What in the fuck was that? Stein gaped. Jinx raised his eyebrows. Looks like Jarvis is having some fun, he said. De Villa glanced out and saw the two zombies that had been heading their way had changed their trajectory, and were moving towards the explosion. They leaned against the building, watching as they shambled by harmlessly. Jinx raised a fist. They're going to be here soon, he said. Let's get over to the fireworks stand. The soldiers looked out, noting several of the zombies in the street turning towards the explosion in the distance. Jinx waited until there was a significant opening. Twenty yards between groups, and then broke cover. He led his team across the street towards the grocery store, running hard. A few of the zombies spotted them and changed course to follow, but only a handful. Keep moving, Jinx instructed. We'll worry about them later. They reached the parking lot and rushed the fireworks stand. It was a small building, a converted mobile home. The three others stood guard as Jinx worked on the door. A dozen zombies wandered towards them, but none were closer than forty yards. Jinx jiggled the door handle, finding it locked. Rather than worry about picking it, he drew his knife and shoved it into the mechanism. The cheap material shattered as he gave the handle of the blade a good hard smack. We're in, he said, and then opened the door cautiously, keeping the knife at the ready. He stepped inside, finding the building abandoned. Sunlight pierced the cheap curtains hanging over the windows, revealing a treasure trove of consumer-grade explosives. Jinx looked around and found some Roman candles, grabbing a pack and tossing it to Davila. Start lighting them up to signal Jarvis, he suggested. The private ripped the packaging open with excitement, brandishing his lighter and sparking up the end of one of the candles. Man, this shit makes me miss the Fourth of July, he said. The fuse ignited, quickly vanishing into the handheld device. He aimed it high and towards the road, and soon the first colourful ball of flame shot out. It arced high, landing on the road and burning for several seconds. Ten bucks says you can't hit one of the zombies, Roland said. De Villa smirked. Shit, man, make it twenty. Done, his friend replied. De Villa adjusted his aim, the next ball flying just over the head of one of the zombies coming their way, 
still twenty yards from them. Shit, double or nothing, he said. Done, Rollins repeated with a lopsided grin. De Villa lowered the trajectory as the next colourful ball jetted out. It flew through the air, landing on the shirt collar of a bloody corpse in business attire. The bright blue flame stuck to the clothing, quickly setting it ablaze. De Villa and Stein cheered while Rollins muttered obscenities under his breath. Jinx poked his head out the door. What in the hell are you doing out here? he asked. De Villa held up the empty candle. Just want to bet against Rollins, he declared, and pointed to the flaming zombie, now fully engulfed in fire. Nice shot, the corporal replied. But can you guys clear them out? We're going to have stuff to load in. Rollins raised an eyebrow. Doing some shopping? Jinx grinned. Just seems criminal not to use this stuff. De Villa inclined his head towards the small pack of zombies still ambling towards them. Come on, let's go clear them out, he said, and lit up another Roman candle, aiming it towards the road as they headed towards the pack. He hung back as Rollins and Stein made quick work of the ghouls, stabbing them in the head and dropping them. As they wrapped up, an engine roared in the distance. De Villa lit up another candle, keeping the flames going to the road. A few moments later, Jarvis rolled into view, making the turn into the parking lot. She skidded to a stop in front of her smiling friend. Where the hell did you find a Roman candle at? She asked through the open window. De Villa jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Firework stand, he said. Jinx is over there and says we need to load up. We're going to have to hurry, Jarvis replied, getting a good number of them coming from the bridge. De Villa nodded as she sped off towards the stand. Rollins, he said. Let's go check it out. The duo headed towards the road as Stein jogged back to help load up the fireworks. As they approached the main road, a few more zombies came into view. A new group appearing from the shops across the street. They were more than twenty yards away, so the soldiers didn't pay them any mind for the time being. Yikes, Roland said as he looked towards the bridge. That looks like a shit show. There were a few dozen zombies emerging from it, shambling towards their position. Well, it doesn't look like we need to worry about attracting attention to ourselves anymore, De Villa replied. He pulled out his handgun, took aim at the trio of zombies headed their way from the store, and opened fire. In three quick shots they lay motionless on the ground. Come on, let's get back, he said. As the duo approached the stand, Stein was just shutting the tailgate. De Villa hopped up to get a look at the bed. Holy hell, clearing them out, aren't you? he asked with a laugh, and looked closer. Man, there's mortars, high-end rockets, bricks of firecrackers. We're going to have a good old time, aren't we? Jinx nodded. We have to do whatever we can to keep them on their side of the bridge, and nothing brings them in like an explosion, he said. Jarvis raised a hand. I can attest to that, she said proudly. Yeah, what the hell was that anyway? Rollins asked. Birch grinned. Just your local gas station. Wonder what Captain Odom is going to have to say about that? Stein raised an eyebrow. Jinx shrugged. As long as we complete the mission, not much, he said. He tossed in another handful of firecrackers before hopping over into the back of the truck. So let's get a move on, and we won't get chewed out. Chapter 7 Jarvis revved the engine as Jinx, Rollins, and De Villa clambered up into the truck bed, laying down on top of the explosives. The corporal smacked the side of the truck to let her know she was good to go. She peeled out of the parking lot, Stein and Birch jostling to the right as she turned onto the road leading to the bridge. There were easily a hundred zombies standing between them and the target, and she stopped, opening up the window behind her. What do you think? she asked. Jinx sat up and looked out, cocking his head as he studied the densely packed horde. This thing got some juice to it? he asked. Oh yeah, Jarvis replied, nodding. Could probably clear one of those hybrid cars if I picked up enough speed. Jinx gave her a thumbs up and laid back down. Lead on then, he called, and they held on to the side of the bed tightly. Jarvis revved the engine, prompting everyone to be ready. She floored it picking up speed quickly, and within moments the truck smacked into the front edge of the pack, sending zombies flying every which way. The men in the back watched bloody rotted limbs sailing around, corpses and crushed bodies landing on other zombies, 
creating a total mess. The momentum of the truck slowed as they pushed through, but the lift kit kept the vital components of the truck out of harm's way. Soon they were through the other side, driving onto the bridge. Jinx raised his head to look through the back window, watching the daylight between them and the next batch of zombies at the head of the bridge. There were a few dozen spread out across it, all shambling towards them. Hold up here, he called. Jarvis stopped the vehicle and Davila sat up. Yo, we're not drawing that big of a crowd back here, he reported. Jinx looked back and saw that the zombies they'd ploughed through were mostly turning and walking away, with only a few coming towards them. Well, why don't you do something about it? he asked. Just don't blow us up. Davila grinned, looking around through their stash for something to use. He finally settled on a large mortar device a two-foot-tall metal tube with balls of explosives in the package. He grabbed it and jumped down onto the bridge. "'Cover me, guys,' he declared, and then knelt to get set up. Jinx and Rollins each took a side of the truck, readying their handguns. As they did so, a few corpses staggered by, headed towards their friend. They both aimed down, firing at near-point-blank range to drop their respective enemies. Davila gleefully opened the package like a kid at Christmas, positioning the mortar tube at a low angle, almost horizontal to the ground. He propped it up with his foot while he lit one end of the explosives and shoved it in. Fire in the hole! he barked, and a few seconds later the mortar went off, rocketing across the bridge just a few feet above the pavement. The aim was true striking a zombie directly in the back, exploding in a grand display of colourful flames. Davila let out a celebratory whoop before loading up another one. The second shot was on target as well, striking a turning zombie in the chest and knocking it back, setting a small fire on its blood-stained shirt. The noise and the fires attracted most of the zombies that had been wandering away from them. Davila glanced over his shoulder just in time to see Rollins fire off a few more shots, taking out the last of the would-be attackers. Jinx grabbed a large brick of firecrackers. All right, saddle up, he said. I think that's as good as we're getting with those. Davila tossed the mortar device back into the truck and climbed up as Jinx lit the firecrackers and tossed them out onto the asphalt. He smacked the roof of the truck and Jarvis took off again. As they picked up speed to ram through the next batch of zombies, the firecrackers went off, loud, sustained snapping filling the air. Hey, Jarvis, once we're through, Jinx called through the window as he exchanged a fist bump with Davila. Stop at the next safe area so we can keep this up. Chapter 8 Jarvis drove the truck around slowly as the boys were on the ground, setting up fireworks to go off. There were a few hundred zombies on the main road headed towards them but nearly a football field away. Rollins aimed his assault rifle down the side street, firing off a few shots and taking out some nearby zombies that were attracted to the noise. Davila and Stein set up a row of mortars on the roadway, lighting them up at the same time to send up a barrage of explosives, hoping that the combined noise would draw more zombies in. Birch found a metal dumpster in an alley, running up to it and throwing in a brick of firecrackers, a few moments later there was a loud metallic echo reverberating through the alley. When he looked back, he saw smoke rising from the dumpster and Jinx approached, chuckling. Well, if that isn't a metaphor for the last month, he said. Birch snorted. No shit. Jarvis honked the horn to get everyone's attention, coming to a stop. All right, really starting to draw a crowd up here, she announced. Let's get moving to the next site. Jinx walked up to the window and she handed over the satellite image of the area, where she'd put several red X marks on the map, showing locations to the west of the bridge. So, where are we at? he asked as he surveyed it. Jarvis pointed to the locations as she spoke. About six blocks due west of the bridge, she explained. I think we need to put some significant distance between us and the bridge this time. Agreed, the corporal said. If there are any on the other side of the bridge, they aren't going to care about the noise we're making this far out. We need to focus on keeping the ones here occupied. Several gunshots erupted from the other soldiers as they cleared out nearby ghouls coming from alleys and stores. Neither Jinx nor Jarvis even flinched at the noise. If we can find some place we can rig to blow like that gas station, that would be ideal, the corporal mused. Jarvis shrugged. 
I haven't seen any yet, she admitted. And, from the looks of it, we're about to get into some real residential areas for a bit. Couple of house fires, maybe? he asked. Might get lucky with them having gas instead of electric. She shook her head, smiling. You were totally a little arsonist as a kid, weren't you? she asked. Yeah, pleading the fifth on that one, he replied. A few more gunshots went off, and then the rest of the team clambered up into the truck. Jinx used the back tire as a foothold and hopped into the bed with Davila and Rollins. So, what are we doing next? Davila asked. Jinx jerked a thumb over his shoulder as he sat down. Start a few house fires, he replied. See if we can get a gas explosion. Hell yeah, his friend replied with a grin. I'm in. Jarvis drove the group a few blocks up, smacking into several clusters of undead on the road while the fireworks in the background attracted more ghouls from every nook and cranny on the roadside. The neighborhood was middle class, with nice brick homes stretching along the tree-lined streets. Jarvis drove up to an intersection with houses stretching in every direction and slowed to a stop. As the boys hopped out, she hung out of the window. Hey, Jinx, I got an idea, she said. He approached her. Let's hear it, he said. We got plenty of those fireworks, right? She asked, motioning to the back of the truck. We should set some of them up by the windows and doors of the houses you're setting on fire. It'll be like an extended fuse on them, so we can get a little more bang for our buck. Jinx nodded and whirled his hand in the air. You heard the lady, he declared. Let's set us up some extra party favors. Davila and Rollins grabbed large handfuls of fireworks out of the back and followed the other three up to the nearest house. As they set them up along the windows, the corporal led the way inside. He smashed open the front door, assault rifle raised. There were two zombies in the kitchen, staggering towards them, and he quickly put them down. Birch, check the stove, see if it's gas, Jinx said. Stein, keep watch. The men leapt into action as the corporal pulled a blanket off of a shelf and stretched it over the couch. He pulled out his lighter, but then Jarvis's horn sounded. Everything okay? Rollins called. Jinx furrowed his brow. Not sure, he replied, and then looked out the window. Jarvis stood in the driver's side door, frantically waving her arms to get him to come over. You boys finish this up and get the fire going, he instructed. I'm going to go see what the problem is. He headed out the front door and walked casually towards the truck. Jarvis hopped out and ran over to him, unable to wait for him to reach her at his slow pace. Christ, what's up? he demanded. She held out the walkie-talkie, thrusting it at him. It's Dickerson, she said. Jinx immediately raised the device to his lips. Sergeant, it's Jinx. What's going on? Thank Christ, Dickerson gushed. We're pinned down and in need of immediate backup. The corporal's brow furrowed. What do you mean, you're pinned down? We would ran into a shitload of these motherfuckers and got driven into a house, the sergeant explained. We're completely surrounded, and there's hundreds of these things. Don't know how much longer we can hold out. There was deafening gunfire before he let go of the button. We're on our way, Jinx replied immediately. Where are you? North side of town, three, maybe four blocks due east of the hospital, Dickerson replied. Don't have an address, but when you see the shitstorm, we'll be in the middle of it. Jinx nodded firmly. Hang tight, Dickerson. We're on our way. He lowered the radio, jaw clenched. I know we need to help them, Jarvis said slowly. But what about our mission? The corporal shoved two fingers in his mouth and let out a piercing whistle, his team immediately rushing out of the house. What's up? the villa asked as they approached. Jinx took a deep breath. Sergeant Dickerson and his team are in a heap of trouble, he replied. We're going to bail them out. Davila, Rollins, can you two handle the house fires? Absolutely, Davila replied immediately. Jinx held out his hand. Map. Jarvis reached into her pocket and grabbed the paper, slapping it into his hand. He unfolded it and quickly studied it, seeing a large white-roofed building in the middle of the green residential area. Okay. I want fires every half block, alternate sides of the street, he began. Pull out the fireworks that you can and use them. He pointed to the white-roofed building. Rendezvous at whatever this building is ten blocks to the west. Given the location, it's probably a school or community center. If it's too dangerous, meet one block to the west in the corner house. Now, let's move. The villa nodded and pointed at his teammates. Birch, Stein, help us unload the fireworks, he said. Just dump them in the street and we'll find a wheelbarrow or something to get them moved. 
The four soldiers rushed off to do as Jinx and Jarvis studied the map. We're six blocks south and a few blocks to the west of the hospital, the corporal mused as he pointed to the map. So they're somewhere in this area. I think if we come up to this road, we should be able to find them. Jarvis nodded but cocked her head. And what do we do once we find them? she asked. Haven't thought that far ahead, Jinx admitted, and shoved the map into his pocket. Now let's move. Chapter 9 The drive to the north side of town was tense. The soldiers on edge, worrying about what they were going to find. Jarvis slowed down as they reached the neighborhood and slowed to a stop after Jinx smacked the side of the truck. We should walk from here, he suggested. We have to be close and don't want attention on us until we're ready for it. The quartet readied their weapons and the corporal made sure to grab the walkie-talkie and stuff it into his pocket before leading the group away. The neighborhood had a handful of zombies milling about, all of them headed northward. There was sporadic gunfire in the distance, but it was muffled, sounding like it was from inside a building. That's gotta be them, Jink said. The soldiers moved quietly, creeping quickly, but as lightly as they could. They got off of the main road, walking between the houses, letting the grass soften their footsteps. Jinx made sure to be cautious, stopping at every corner of each house, not wanting to end up surprised with a bad situation. After a couple of blocks, the corporal finally spotted the target house across the street. He motioned for the team to be silent, leading them to the back porch. He pulled out his knife and slid it into the lock, slamming down on the handle with his hand to use brute force to open it up. He moved inside, motioning for Jarvis to cover the other hallway. As soon as she set foot on the carpet, a zombie lumbered out from a bedroom, and she kicked it in the chest, knocking it to the floor. She shoved her boot into its throat and stabbed it in the forehead, then finished her sweep before rejoining the others in the main room. We're clear, she said. Jinx waved to the team from the front. Window, he said. They moved to the front window, standing on either side of it so they could see out without being visible. The situation across the street was dire. The entire front of Dickerson's house was covered with zombies, stretching twenty-five, thirty ghouls deep. I've played concerts with fewer people, Stein murmured. Jarvis shook her head. That's what you get for playing in a shitty band. Hey now, I... Stein began, but then shook his head. Yeah, you're right. We were shitty. Jinx pulled out the walkie-talkie, raising it to his lips. Dickerson, do you copy? Jinx, where are you? The sergeant replied immediately. Not sure how much longer we can hold out. The front door is starting to crack under the pressure. The corporal peered out at the crowd. We're across the street. All right, Dickerson replied. First order of business is going to be moving some of these fuckers away from the door. Too many are pushing on it, and we can't hold it up much longer. Ten four, Jinx said. Give me a minute to come up with a plan. Understood, the sergeant replied. We ain't going anywhere. The corporal lowered the radio, studying the area. Ideas? We got some fireworks left. We can try and peel them away, Birch suggested. Jink shook his head. Too many of those things are engaged. They aren't going to break away for some firecrackers, he said. We could fire the Roman candles into the crowd, Stein piped up. Start lighting some of them up. Jinx pursed his lips for a moment. That's a plan of last resort, he replied. On the one hand, it might work, but on the other, it might set the house on fire. With our luck, it would be the latter, Stein muttered. I could plow the truck through them, Jarvis suggested. If I build up enough speed, I should be able to make it from one side to the other, cut their numbers in half. Birch shook his head. But that would only be temporary, he said. Plus, if you don't make it across, we'd have to walk back, and I'm already getting enough exercise for the day. So you don't want to do my plan because you're a lazy fucker? She raised an eyebrow. He shrugged. And because it's a temporary solution. Jinx studied the landscape, paying special attention to a large thick tree on the other side of a fence that was parallel to the horde and just up from the front of the house. I like that idea, he said. Birch blinked at him. Really? he asked. You want to risk the truck? Nope, and we're not going to, the corporal replied, shaking his head. But I like the idea of cutting their numbers in half. Jarvis raised an eyebrow. So if we're not going to use the truck, how are we going to do it? Jinx smirked and pointed towards the giant tree he'd spotted. Who wants to be a lumberjack? 
Jarvis put a hand to her forehead, laughing in exasperation. The other two shook their heads in disbelief. All right, Birch finally said, smacking his thighs as he stood up. I'll check the garage. Stein jerked a thumb over his shoulder. I'm pretty sure we passed a workshed on the last block. I'll go check that, he said. I'll let Dickerson know what the plan is, Jink said. Jarvis snorted. That should be a fun conversation. The corporal chuckled as he lifted the radio to his mouth. Dickerson, come in, he said. We have a plan. Chapter 10 Are you out of your fucking mind? The sergeant demanded. Jink shrugged. Might have been accused of that from time to time, he drawled. Nothing was ever proven, though. Jokes. You got jokes? Dickerson snapped. That's great. Look, there's only four of us with limited resources, Jink shot back. We're in a serious ticking time bomb scenario right now, and I have the only pair of wire cutters, as it were. If you have a better idea, I'm all ears. But unless I'm mistaken, if that idea takes longer than ten minutes, you and your boys are toast. There was a long pause on the line before the sergeant finally asked, Have you even ever cut down a tree before? No, Jinx admitted sheepishly. But I watched a lot of those lumberjack competitions at 2 a.m. on ESPN2 back in the day. Pretty sure I got the angle concept down. There was a torrent of gunfire from the house, and then Dickerson came back. Fuck it, man, he said. Do what you gotta do. We're on the move. Good luck, Sarge, Jinx said. Same to you, Dickerson replied. The corporal put the walkie-talkie away, and he and Jarvis stood up. As they walked to the back door, Birch entered, hands empty. Nothing? Jinx asked. Birch shook his head. Not even a lawnmower, he replied. Guess whoever lived here was living high on the hog and hiring someone to cut the grass. Good life if you can get it, Jarvis added. Stein came busting in through the back door holding a giant chainsaw above his head. Leatherface, bitches, he cried. Yeah! He waved it around for a moment and then lowered his arms when he realized nobody was reacting. I mean, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Nobody? Chainsaw killers are a lot more effective when the saw is actually on. Jarvis said, crossing her arms. Stein's shoulders slumped, and he held out the weapon to Jinx. Okay, we're moving three houses up, cutting across the street and working our way back, the corporal said as he took the chainsaw. From this vantage point, the yard looks pretty clear, as that fence is holding them back. That's probably going to change real quick once I fire this thing up, he motioned to the soldiers as he spoke. Jarvis, you cover our rear. Stein and Birch, you clear out as many of those things beside the house as you can. If this thing lands right, we may only have a short window to get them out. Everybody clear? At the affirmative, he nodded and led the group outside. He ran up several houses as quickly as he could, adrenaline pumping with the clock. He peered around the corner of the third house, seeing that the road and yard straight across was clear. Jinx darted out, carrying the chainsaw upwards while the others kept their assault rifles aimed and ready. They got across the street without any problems and moved across the front yards of the houses, working their way back to the tree. When they reached the target yard, they hopped the four-foot-tall wooden fence, landing safely in the private yard. As Jinx rushed over to the tree, the others did a quick sweep to make sure the area was clear. The corporal took a knee, readying the chainsaw, waiting for his team to get in position. Once they gave him the all-clear, they all braced to unleash fury. Jinx pulled the starter cord on the saw and it roared to life, but then fell silent. The noise was enough to attract the attention of several of the zombies on the other side of the fence. They turned, moaning and pressing themselves against the wood. Jinx pulled the cord a second time, failing again, and Stein and Birch opened fire, popping off in three round bursts, dispersing hot lead in a wide arc and dropping several of the ghouls. Come on, you piece of shit, Jinx muttered and gave the cord another hard pull. This time the engine snarled to life, and he hit the throttle a few times, revving it up to make sure it stayed on. As soon as it was steady, he picked it up and put the hammer down. The blade pierced the bark of the tree, and he cut straight down, creating a large notch in the front of it. Then he got to work on the base. Jarvis kept a watch on their rear as the corporal worked, popping off a few shots as some zombies started trying to come over the fence at the top of the yard. As she fired, the other two continued to unload on the horde, 
both of them clearing out a full mag each and reloading, leaving a pile of corpses beside the house and directly in front of it. Jinx managed to get the saw most of the way through the tree and noticed it starting to collapse into the notch he'd cut out. He turned the chainsaw off and stood up. Timber! he yelled. Birch and Stein sprinted away from the falling tree, leaping to the other side as the big thing sailed into the neighboring yard. Jinx had been hoping for it to fall diagonally across, but his cutting wasn't up to par, and it tumbled straight across. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, he muttered as he watched it fall across the fence into the other yard, crushing through a row of zombies no more than five feet from the front of the house. The gutters at the far end of the house ripped clean from the branches, but no other major damage was done to the house. Oh hell yeah, he bellowed, just like I planned. The zombies were only too deep in front of the house, and the trunk was large enough to create a decent barrier from the rest of the horde. Jinx pulled out the walkie-talkie. Dickerson, get a move on, he yelled. Move to our position. Birch and Stein concentrated their fire on either side of the tree, which had damaged the wooden fence a bit. Thankfully, not so much that the zombies could push through. Jarvis, clear in front of the house, Jinx barked. She turned her attention towards the house, aiming straight down the line and opening fire in single shots, picking off one ghoul after another like a carnival game. The corporal smirked, starting the chainsaw back up and leaning over the fence on the roadside. He stretched over, working his way towards the road, cutting into rotted necks with the blade, sending gore and blood everywhere. This was short-lived, as the chainsaw quickly got mucked up with bone stalling out. Jinx dropped the saw, having enjoyed the small pleasure, and then glanced over at the door to see Dickerson emerge with his troops. Torrents of bullets cleared a path and they hopped down into the gully between the house and tree, racing towards the fence. Jinx and Jarvis reached over to help them over one by one, and the six soldiers escaped certain doom, hopping over to relative safety. Come on, our truck is a few blocks away, the corporal said, waving them over. Dickerson nodded, and he and his team followed the group out of the yard, hopping over the fence on the other side. The ten soldiers raced through the neighborhood, running through yards and quickly losing the horde that had been in pursuit. After several minutes of hard running, they arrived at the truck, thankfully with no zombies around. The soldiers all caught their breaths, letting out some disbelieving laughter at their luck. I gotta say, Jinx, Dickerson huffed, you don't disappoint. The corporal grinned. Glad I could be of service, sergeant, he replied. Everybody make it out okay? All six of my team are safe and sound, Dickerson replied, straightening up. And I got to check off a bucket list item, Jinx declared, so it's a win-win. The sergeant chuckled. Yeah, I've always wanted to carve up zombies with a chainsaw too, he admitted. No, I'm talking about being a lumberjack, Jinx said with a wink. Could never get a full beard to grow in so I had to abandon that dream. Dickerson lost it, laughter exploding from his belly. You're a fucking wild man, he gasped, smacking his friend on the shoulder. Never change. Can we drop you boys off somewhere? Jinx asked, patting the side of the truck. The sergeant shook his head. I think we can take it from here, he said. You get back to doing what you were doing, he extended his hand, and the men shook hands. I won't forget this. I definitely owe you one. Given the shit I get myself into, I can all but guarantee I'll need to call that in sooner rather than later, Jinx replied. Be safe, Dickerson said. We'll see you on the march to Olympia. Jarvis hopped up into the driver's seat and started it up, the rest of Jinx's team clambering into the back. The corporal smacked the side and she took off, leaving Dickerson waving to them as they peeled out. Chapter 11 Jarvis drove down the residential streets towards the rally point. As they went, the soldiers could see large plumes of smoke rising in the distance, with the occasional firework or brick of firecrackers detonating as well. They looked down the side streets, seeing straggler zombies, but none of them in packs greater than five, wandering towards the noise and smoke. As Jarvis reached the turn-off road, she looked both ways. Back towards the bridge there were a couple hundred zombies, all moving across the road into the neighborhood. Hope flared in her chest that the distraction was working. 
The other direction was a little more sparse, as the noise from the distractions were waning a little at that point. She made the turn, speeding off towards the rally point. After several blocks she stopped at the corner of an intersection. Davila and Rollins waved at them from a playground swing set in front of the school. They were the picture of relaxation, swinging lightly back and forth. They hopped down and headed for the truck as their teammates exited the vehicle. Looks like Operation Arson was a roaring success, Jinx said as he hit the pavement. Davila grinned. Yep, got a lot of those fuckers burning, he declared. Made sure the houses we picked didn't have overhanging trees to try to limit the damage to the neighborhood as a whole. Good thinking, the corporal replied, cocking his head. Any houses with gas? he asked. Right as the words left his mouth, there was a gigantic explosion in the distance, and they all turned to look at a fireball shooting up into the air over the trees. Just one, Roland said. Jinx nodded in appreciation. If nothing else, I have timing, he said. How did it go with Dickerson? Davila asked. Birch raised his hands above his head. Jinx saved the day by going full lumberjack. Bucket list item? Davila replied with a smirk. I like it. Day's not over yet, Jinx cut in. You still got time to make some off your list. Birch barked a laugh. He just burned down an entire neighborhood worth of houses, he said. He should be good. Hey now, Davila piped up with mock offense. Why would you think that's on my bucket list? Birch rolled his eyes. We've all heard you talk about the horrors of suburbs, he pointed out. Eh, fair, Davila admitted. Hop in, Jinx said, motioning to the truck. We gotta get to the main target. We should be close enough to it now to draw any zombies on this side to it. The soldiers climbed up and Jarvis drove through the back half of the residential area. Davila and Rollins lighting fireworks and tossing them over the side in an attempt to pull the ghouls in their direction. After several blocks, the residential area turned into retail, with small shops dotting the landscape alongside a few mini-malls. Zombie infestation was moderate in that area, the parking lots only having groups of twenty to thirty. Jinx motioned for them to stop throwing out fireworks as the truck noise seemed to be attracting enough that they could handle. There was a huge vacant lot on the far south of town, and Jarvis pulled into it. It was a corner lot, with the main river to the south and the smaller river running to the north. There was no resistance nearby, with the zombies on the bridge or congregating around buildings. As soon as the truck came to a halt, Jinx, Davila, and Rollins quickly hopped out, rushing towards the five zombies in the lot and quickly dispatching them with their knives. The corporal was particularly vicious, running at full speed towards the first one and jamming his blade through its eye and shoving it straight out the back breaking the skull open. He moved in a single motion, stabbing into the forehead of the one behind it. With the lot relatively secure, the group rallied in the back of the truck. Jinx pulled out the satellite image of the immediate area and pointed to it as he spoke. Okay, listen up, he began. To us south here is the bridge going over whatever major river that is. To be blunt, that's someone else's problem. To our north are two commuter bridges that cross over into what looks like Supercenter Island because that's all that's there. We have to get over there, create a hell of a ruckus, pull as many of those things over as we can, and escape via the water. We also have to block off the bridges with whatever cars we can find. Jarvis pointed to another bridge over the river that looked darker than the obvious commuter bridge. Any idea what this thing is? Best guess is a rail bridge, Jinx replied with a shrug. Not exactly conducive for zombies to get over, but could be our ticket across the river. Davila nodded thoughtfully. So, what do you think? he asked. Two teams, one on cars, one on diversion? Works for me, Jinx agreed. Jarvis, why don't you play escort around the town? Birch grinned. Not the first time she's been an escort around town. One more word, Jarvis said, pointing a finger at him, and I will bend you over the back of this truck. Jinx laughed. I'll give her the time, too, just to see it happen, he offered. I withdraw the previous insult, Birch replied, raising his palms in surrender. The corporal shook his head. Well, Birch, I think for your own safety you'll be coming with me and Davila to the supercenter, he said with a chuckle. Jarvis, you drive Rollins and Stein around to find some cars. Stash them across the street from the bridge so we can move them quickly once we get enough of those things over the bridges. Questions? Yeah, Jarvis said. 
Where are we meeting once we get this done? Jinx pointed to the map. Just across the southern bridge, there is some sort of store, he explained. Get inside and get to the roof. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm ready to relax, so let's knock this out. All right, boys, Jarvis declared, clapping her hands together. Hop in. We're going car shopping. She got into the driver's seat and shot Jinx a salute. See you soon. Once the other two were secure, she did a burnout, kicking up dirt as she sped off towards the retail area in search of cars. The three remaining soldiers coughed, waving their hands in front of their faces to avoid breathing in the dust. That's on you, Birch, Davila gasped. Yeah, I know, he replied. Just couldn't resist. Jinx whirled a hand above his head. Train tracks, let's do it, he said and led his team across the vacant lot to the property line. They looked out towards the supercenter, the massive store sitting no more than thirty yards from the water, which ran on both the back and left side of the store. Two hundred yards to the north was the rail bridge, a rusted-out truss bridge stretching over the water. There were a handful of zombies on their side of the bridge, which was a far cry from the transportation bridges half a mile further to the north, Jinx pulled out the binoculars and scanned, letting out a low whistle as he did. That doesn't look like fun, he muttered, and handed off the device to Davila. The private peered through the binoculars, checking out the bridges packed with hundreds of zombies each, easily close to a thousand between the two. Yeah, that rail bridge is a good call, he said, lowering the device. But how are we going to pull them off of it and over to the store? Jinx smirked and reached into his bag. Remember how I said I got us a few things for the mission? Yeah, Davila raised an eyebrow. Jinx pulled out a hand grenade, tossing one over to his teammate. A grin broke out on Davila's face. Oh, now we're cooking, he declared. Figure it should be loud enough to draw them over to us, Jinx said. Maybe take out a fast food joint or two in the process? Birch nodded. Find one of those flame-grilled places and set off the gas too. Jinx rubbed his hands together. Let's go see what kind of trouble we can get into. Chapter 12 Jinx led the trio across the bridge, Davila playfully walking along the rail like a kid balancing. The other two strolled across the beams, enjoying the brief bit of quiet before the coming battle. Man, I used to do this all the time when I was younger. Davila said as he moved gracefully across the rail. My brothers and I would walk for miles on the tracks, even going over to the next town some days. Jinx shook his head. I had the benefit of growing up in a neighborhood where I was the youngest kid by about five years, he said. So when the rest of the kids hit high school, my only options were to wander around alone or play video games. Which did you pick? Birch asked. If Jinx ever bets he can beat your Gallagher high score, Davila cut in. Just save time and hand over your money. The corporal shrugged. On the plus side, my hand-eye coordination is next level. What about you, Birch? Davila asked, stretching out his arms to keep his balance. Happy-go-lucky childhood, or sad glowing screen childhood? Birch shook his head. Neither, he admitted. Been working since I was fourteen and haven't stopped since. Christ, that's sad, Davila said with a sigh. Yo, Jinx. Can we pick him up a Game Boy or something at the Super Center before we head out? Hell, it'll even be my treat. Birch barked a laugh. Nah, don't need a Game Boy, he assured his friend. But if you come across a bottle of scotch... That's a man with priorities, Jinx declared, snapping his fingers. I dig it. They went quiet when they reached the end of the bridge, seeing a couple of zombies wandering by, stumbling over the side of the rail. Jinx motioned for the other two to move up to take them out quietly, while he covered them with his rifle. The duo broke rank, rushing forward with their knives and stabbing into the zombies' skulls as the creatures tried to get up. Jinx walked to the end of the rail bridge, sweeping the area carefully. There were a couple dozen zombies spread out in the area leading up to the supercenter. They took a knee in the field across from the parking lot, surveying the situation, Jinx pulled out the binoculars and scanned the lot, honing in on a flame-grilled burger restaurant at the far end near the road, with forty to fifty zombies in their path and a couple hundred more on the road leading to the nearby bridge. Gonna be one hell of a run, the corporal murmured. 
He passed the binoculars to the others, who took turns looking at the scene. Maybe we can get into the supercenter and find something useful in there? Davila suggested. Jinx pursed his lips. Hold that thought, he said, and broke rank, running up to the building and hugging the wall. He crept along it and peeked around the corner, checking out the thirty or so zombies milling about the front entrance. He grimaced and then darted back to his team. Well, that idea's out, he said quietly. Birch cocked his head. How bad? Thirty, maybe a few more, Jinx replied. Won't be any problem to take them out, but if we do, the ones from the road will swamp the restaurant. Davila held out the binoculars. So straight to the restaurant then, huh? he asked. Only play I see, Jinx agreed. We'd run up, hit them hard, and get inside. In and out in sixty, then run like hell to the front entrance of the supercenter. We should be bringing enough noise that it'll pull them away from the entrance, Birch pointed out. Davila nodded. You'd hope, at least. Get inside here, the corporal said. Blow the windows and pull the fire alarm. Birch's brow furrowed. The power has been out for weeks now, he reminded his superior. These supercenters have to fire backup power supplies for fire systems, Davila explained. We just have to hope that the backup battery hasn't gone dead. Birch pursed his lips. And if it has? I'm not opposed to blowing more shit up, Jinx replied. Davila grinned. One track mind, he said. Love it. Okay, the corporal said as he pulled his rifle from his back. Three round bursts. Don't stop moving to aim. Go right up to the center of them. Birch, you're on burner duty. Get that gas flowing. Davila, you sweep the room. I'll take care of the exit route. We good? The trio readied their guns, and then Jinx broke cover, his teammates a few yards to either side of him. They moved quickly, almost at a full sprint, running towards the group of zombies near the restaurant. They were about forty yards between the first zombie and the eatery, moderately packed in. Jinx fired first, clipping two ghouls in the head, and they pushed through. Davila opened fire, aiming slightly to his left to attack a trio that had turned their attention towards them. Birch let rip on his group, just to the right, doing his part to keep the alleyway open. The gunfire was intense, with all three soldiers releasing trios of shots one right after the other. The zombies began to move towards them, arms outstretched and mouths open with excitement, and the gaps began to close. When they were within twenty yards of the restaurant, the pack started to get closer together, shoulder to shoulder as Jinx approached. Everybody forward, he barked. On his command, both de Villa and Birch aimed forward, and the three of them sent a couple dozen rounds towards the front-facing group. The bullets ripped through the decrepit flesh, sending a large number of them tumbling to the ground. Several still remained standing, so the corporal lowered his shoulder and ploughed through, creating an opening for the trio to rush in. The side of the restaurant was ten yards away, and only a couple of ghouls remained in the way. "'Cover the rear!' Jinx yelled and his friends turned to fire at the creatures now chasing them. Jinx stopped, aimed, and fired a burst towards the two zombies in front of him, blowing the backs of their heads clean off. He turned his attention to the large window on the side of the building, sacrificing another three bullets to shatter it to pieces. We're in, he cried, and tore through the window. The other two soldiers joined him in rushing inside. Birch immediately rushed to the back, and as soon as he saw it was clear, he made his way to the gas grill burner. He flicked on the switches and quickly blew out the starter flame before taking a quick sniff. Okay, we're hot, he declared, and darted back out into the main room. De Villa finished his sweep and Jink stood at the window opposite the broken one, looking out at the supercenter. Gas is flowing, Birch said, and then jumped as a few zombies smacked into the open window. The supercenter crowd is headed our way and looking pretty thinned out, Jinx reported. You boys ready for another run? De Villa nodded. Lead the way. The corporal fired a single round at the corner of the window, shattering it. The three soldiers hopped down into the parking lot, doing a quick sweep. The closest zombie was thirty yards away, about halfway between them and their target. Fire in the hole, boys! Jinx yelled, and pulled the pin from the grenade, chucking it back through the window towards the kitchen. The trio immediately sprinted for the supercenter, firing as they tore through the lumbering mass. Jinx fired two bursts, with the third pull of the trigger resulting in a click. He lowered his shoulder, driving himself into the closest zombie and driving him back. 
As he did this, the grenade detonated, igniting the gas. The entire building went up in a spectacular display, sending plumes of smoke and fire into the air. As it happened, Davila moved up to cover for the corporal, firing several bursts into the zombies ahead, clearing up room for them to move. The three men did more ducking and diving, narrowly avoiding outstretched rotted hands as they approached the front of the building. The soldiers quickly reloaded, and Jinx grabbed the door handle, finding it open. Open 24-7, he said with a grin, and then slipped inside cautiously. Davila flicked the lock closed behind them, and the trio crept forward into the front of the store. It was well lit, thanks to the large windows at the front. Jinx moved for the register row, checking every aisle for zombies. He had to fire a few shots here and there, switching to single burst mode, picking off the occasional stray that broke away from the pack. When he reached the end, he saw no other zombies nearby, and headed back for his team. Birch and Davila looked out the front window, watching the raging fire that had once been a restaurant, and a couple hundred zombies coming from the road towards the inferno. "'How's it looking out there?' Jinx asked. Birch shook his head. "'Seeing that restaurant burn like that is really making me miss grilling,' he said. "'One day, chief, one day,' Davila said wistfully. "'Come on, let's clear out our path to the back. We're not out of this yet.' Jinx said, raising his rifle. The three men broke away from the window and began moving swiftly through the dark in the store. They had their flashlights out, aiming them down every aisle as they came across, luckily finding nothing. After a quick trip, they get to the loading dock doors. Jinx gave a silent countdown from three, bursting through the door on one. They quickly swept the back area, seeing nothing but bare concrete flooring with several boxes stacked up. Birch. Jinx said. Check the door and make sure we're good to go. Davila, find us a fire alarm. The two soldiers rushed off to do their assigned tasks, while Jinx looked out the double doors leading to the store. He shone his flashlight around, making sure no ghouls were headed in his direction. Birch opened the back door, looking out to see only a few zombies wandering around the back of the store. He gently shut it and came back over to the corporal. Coast is pretty clear, Birch said. We can get back to the rail bridge. What about the water? Jinx asked. Birch shook his head. We can go that route if we need to as well. Just worried about that southern bridge, Jinx admitted, furrowing his brow. With all this noise, we're going to be pulling zombies up from the south. Davila approached from the back. Got us a fire alarm switch. Good. So here's the plan, Jinx said, waving them towards him. I'm going to take a position by the front windows. You're going to pull the alarm. Then I'm going to open them up. That will draw those things in and make it more difficult for them to wander back out. We get out the back, swim across, then wait for the other troops to do their jobs. Davila nodded. I'm ready when you are. Jinx readied his gun. Let's give it a few more minutes, he said. Give Jarvis time to locate some vehicles. We move in five. Chapter 13 Jarvis drove Rollins and Stein around to some of the businesses a few blocks away from the main road. The zombie resistance was minimal back there, as most of the ghouls had opted to stay on the main road. Got one over there, Rollins said. Jarvis slowed to a stop as Rollins pointed to an SUV sitting in front of a shop. This will make what, three? Jarvis asked. He nodded. Yeah, that should be enough to fill in the gaps on the first bridge, he mused. A few may be able to wander out, but not enough to make a difference. Stein, cover him, she instructed. The two men hopped out of the truck and raced over to the SUV. Rollins immediately began patting his hand underneath the back wheel well. Come on, come on, no whammy, he muttered, and then let out an excited whoop when he felt a small metal box connected to a magnet. He pulled it out and slid it open, revealing the key. Oh, how I love trusting naive people. He clicked the unlock button and the SUV beeped. Come on, Stein, let's roll. His partner headed over to the passenger side and opened the door, immediately jumping back. There was a badly decomposed corpse inside, belted into the seat. The flesh had started to melt away from the body due to the extreme heat in the car over the previous month. The zombie slowly shifted, letting out a low, gurgling moan 
struggling to even move without most of its body mass. Yeah, this one is all you, buddy, Stein said, wrinkling his nose. Rollins looked in through the driver's side and sighed, shaking his head. Can you at least stab it in the head for me? he asked. Don't say I never do anything for you, Stein retorted. He pulled out his knife and jammed it into the zombie's temple, ending its miserable existence. All right, watch out, Rollins said and reached in to unbuckle the corpse. He gave it a shove and the mass of gunk flopped out onto the road. Melted goo slapped everywhere and Stein sighed as a bit sloshed onto his boots. Toot, really, he whined. Roland shrugged. I told you to watch out, he said as he got into the driver's seat. Now you getting in or what? Stein stared down at the slimy passenger seat. I'll hitch a ride with Jarvis, he said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Roland shrugged and started up the SUV, opening all the windows. Baked zombie, huh? He muttered as he nearly gagged on the putrid stench in the car. He popped the vehicle into reverse and pulled out, Jarvis and Stein following close behind. As he drove, there was a gigantic boom in the distance. As he parked in the lot a few blocks down from the bridges, he spotted a giant plume of smoke rising on the horizon. Jinx certainly doesn't disappoint, does he? he said to himself, and got out of the vehicle. The zombies on the bridge began to wander towards the noise, the nearby ghouls in the store parking lots joining them. Quit yapping to yourself and come on, Jarvis barked from the truck. We need a couple more cars for that other bridge. Rollins leapt out of the SUV, leaving the key in it, and hopping up into the back of the truck. Jarvis pulled out of the lot and headed back towards the residential area. Where are you going? Stein asked. A few blocks further back, Jarvis replied. That explosion is going to get everything closer all riled up. She went for six blocks, reaching a cozy tree-lined street. They looked around, trying to find vehicles to borrow. Stein pointed to a house with two sedans sitting outside. That's our winner, he said. Two cars, meaning they probably never got out. Just gotta find the keys and we're rolling. Good enough for me, Jarvis replied. She parked the truck in the driveway and all three got out. They rushed up to the front door and Jarvis nodded to Rollins. He gave the door a forceful front kick, rattling it pretty well but not opening it. He tried again, but the door stayed fast. Jesus Christ, Jarvis muttered. Let me at it. She shoved him out of the way and gave the door a good boot, which freed it from the latch. Stein chuckled. I loosened it for her, Rollins insisted. His friend shook his head. Yeah, I'd totally go with that. Move, Jarvis urged, and the duo snapped back to it, quickly moving into the spacious bungalow. They took up position in the living room, keeping an eye on the hallways. They could hear movement at the far end of it, sounding like several hands banging on a door. Company down the hall, Stein reported. Watch out, Jarvis replied. Roland's kitchen. He moved into the kitchen, scanning the walls for any key ring holders. She did the same in the living room and finally found two sets of keys hanging by the front window. We're moving, she declared, and grabbed the rings, tossing them to the boys. They went back outside and the boys each picked a car, checking thoroughly for any unwanted passengers inside, and thankfully finding none. Jarvis hopped back into the truck and led the caravan back towards the bridges, stopping at the rally point. Most of the zombies had moved across the bridge, but there were still a few dozen making their way towards it. The trio sat in their vehicles with the windows down so they could hear each other. How long do we wait? Rollins asked. Jarvis took a deep breath. As long as we can. We got five minutes at best, Stein said. Jarvis cocked her head. What makes you say that? He pointed towards the southern bridge, half a mile or so away. There were easily a couple hundred zombies moving across it towards them. Fuck, okay, Jarvis said. We need to move, now. Rollins furrowed his brow. And just leave them on this side of the bridge? He asked. She shook her head. It's going to take time for us to do this, she explained. We block off the northern bridge and they can still cross on the southern one. Fuck it, good enough for me, Stein agreed. There were a few broken down cars on the bridge already, so we just have to fill in the gaps. Rollins waved his hand. Well, lead on. Stein popped it into gear and started driving, 
with Rollins behind him and Jarvis bringing up the rear. There were several zombies in the roadway, some of whom turned towards the noise. She gave a single honk of the horn and then floored it. The increased speed sent Jarvis flying around the other two soldiers, pulling in front. She sped up, smacking into the zombies in the road and crushing them, clearing the path for the other two. The bridge had a few dozen zombies on it, most of which were on the far side of it, moving towards the restaurant fire. There were a few cars broken down, having gotten into a crash at some point several weeks ago. There was a gap on either side of the wreck. Jarvis stopped in the middle of the street about thirty yards from the wreck, and the other two drove around her, one on each side. Stein skirted a few dozen zombies and pulled gently into his opening, leaving just enough room to open the door and get out. As he hopped out, he readied his assault rifle, firing a few shots at the throng of ghouls standing between him and the truck. Rollins pulled his car into the gap on the other side, squeezing between the wreck and the side of the bridge. As he started to open his door, he had to shut it again quickly as a zombie from the window of the wrecked car lunged out, smacking against the glass. He clambered into the back seat, opening the back door, but it was wedged up against the wreck, making it impossible to get it wide enough. Fucking shit, man, he muttered, and looked out the back window. There were thirty or so zombies growing ever closer to him. Stein noticed that Rollins was stuck and cupped a hand around his mouth. Shoot the window, he yelled. Rollins gave a thumbs up and drew his handgun, firing a few shots into the back window, shattering it. Stein continued to fire at the coming zombies, attempting to cover his friend as he struggled to get out of the busted window. God damn it, Jarvis muttered and hit the gas, speeding towards her friends. Stein dove to the side to give her a wide berth to do her damage. She drove into the middle of the back and cut the wheel sharply, flooring it. Within seconds she was doing donuts on the bridge, sending zombie bodies and smoking tire debris flying through the air. This gave Rollins enough time to clear the car, and immediately started firing, clearing out the ghouls in his path. After a few full rotations, Jarvis hit the brakes. Come the fuck on, she bellowed. There was still a handful of creatures standing, moving in various directions, but the soldiers were able to avoid them as they raced to the truck. They hopped into the back, smacking the back window of the cab, and Jarvis punched the accelerator to get them out of there. She sped several blocks away from the bridge, skidding to a stop in the residential neighborhood. She opened the back window, eyebrows raised. Holy shit, that was wild, she declared. Everybody good? Rollins made an A-OK sign with his hand. Might need a change of pants, he joked. But other than that, I'm golden. The three shared a relieved laugh and then sat back and relaxed for a moment giving time for the other pack of zombies to make their way to the bridge so they could block it off. Chapter 14 Jinx readied himself by the front window, looking out at the zombies pressed against it. There were dozens of them, and hundreds more in the parking lot, all attracted by the gigantic blast at the restaurant. He checked the ammo on his assault rifle, making sure it was full, when he was satisfied, he let out a two-fingered whistle that echoed throughout the building. A few seconds later, the ear-piercing sound of the fire alarm filled the air. He winced. Christ, it might be less damaging just to be on fire, he muttered, and flipped his rifle into three-round burst mode and aimed at the big windows. He unleashed half a mag's worth of bullets, peppering the windows with them. The impact did little more than put a few holes in it. Fucking safety stuff! He shrugged and reached into his bag, pulling out two grenades, before walking back behind the registers. He pulled the pins on both and lobbed them over to the windows, and then turned tail, sprinting back towards the loading dock. A few seconds later, another earth-shattering boom filled the air. Jinx didn't bother to look back, since if the blast hadn't opened the windows, nothing he had would have. He tore for the loading dock. What happened to just shooting them out? Davila asked wryly. Jink shrugged. Safety glass, so had to go big, he explained. Birch opened the back door and stepped out, immediately raising his rifle and firing several shots as the other two piled out behind him. By the time the trio reunited, the zombies lay on the ground in a heap. Let's get to the water, the corporal instructed, and led his companions across the back of the lot. They pushed through the waist-high grass, splashing down as they reached it. 
they sloshed out into the water, seeing their target on the other side of the southern bridge. Man, that was a good call to go on the water, Davila said. Birch nodded. No kidding. The southern bridge was covered in easily a couple hundred zombies, all moving across it towards the noise. Jarvis ploughed through some of them with the truck, sending bodies flying every which way. Fuck, we gotta move, Jinx urged. She's going to attract a crowd. The soldiers swam as hard as they could towards the southern bank. The current of the river wasn't strong, but they still had to fight against it to make sure they didn't end up downstream. As they paddled across, gunfire erupted from the building up ahead, a lot more sustained than was comfortable. The trio pushed even harder and faster. After a few minutes of intense swimming, they finally reached the other bank, just below the store. Gasping for air, they staggered forward, pulling their rifles from their backs. Suck it up, boys, Jinx huffed. We gotta get up there. They climbed the grassy hill, struggling to reach the top with their slippery boots and heaving lungs. When they finally crested the hill, they saw their three teammates standing in the back of the truck, firing down at a small army of zombies, easily sixty or seventy strong. Clear them out, Jinx barked, and the trio raised their weapons, hitting the ghouls from the side. The mass of rotted flesh was twenty yards away, which was an easy distance for headshots. A few of the creatures nearest the new source of noise turned to move towards it, just in time to take a bullet to the face. The soldiers burned through mag after mag, sweating and breathing hard, focused on the battle raging around the truck. Finally the battlefield fell silent, the last of the corpses fallen, and the soldiers lowered their weapons. Jinx looked back towards the bridge and the top of the driveway. There was a smattering of zombies staggering their way, but they were still fifty yards and moving slowly in the heat. Get the bridges squared away? the corporal asked. Jarvis hopped down from the truck. Not a hundred percent, but the ones on the other side are going to have a hell of a time getting back, she said. Good enough for me, Jinx replied. Birch took a knee to catch his breath. So now what? he asked. Jinx jerked his thumb over his shoulder at the grocery store. Let's go clear that out, get comfortable, and wait on help to get here. Chapter 15 The sun hung low in the sky, bathing the front of the grocery store in a golden glow. The reflections on the nearby water caused the front window to sparkle. Sergeant Dickerson led a squad several hundred strong across the southern bridge, ignoring the stray zombies his men took care of for him. He looked at the grocery store across the way, looking beautiful in the evening light, and spotted the truck that Jarvis had been driving earlier in the day. He shook his head at the mountain of dead zombies around the vehicle. I think we found them, he said. Sir? the soldier next to him asked. Come on, Dickerson said. Let's go make sure they're safe. He motioned for a few soldiers to follow him as the rest of the force moved into the southern portion of town. They carefully stepped through the sea of corpses on the way to the front door, and the sergeant's heart leapt into his throat at the sight of smoke coming out of the seams. He rushed up and banged on it. A moment later, Birch appeared waving smoke away, and when he locked eyes with Dickerson, he grinned and opened the door, a flood of smoke billowing out. What the hell is going on in here? the sergeant asked, walking inside. Birch held up a metal spatula, motioning to the charcoal grill behind him. The others waved, kicking back in chairs with their feet propped up on checkout lanes. Dickerson laughed, shaking his head. Sergeant! Jinx bellowed, spreading his arms. Welcome! Can we get you something? Lukewarm beverage? Something from the grill? Dickerson put a hand to his forehead in disbelief, still laughing. Right in the middle of the biggest invasion in U.S. history was a cluster of soldiers having a cookout. Jinx? It's been nearly a month since this place had a fresh delivery or power, he declared, so I'm afraid to ask what you're cooking up. Birch used a pair of tongs to hold up a slice of canned meat, grilled to perfection. This stuff takes forever to go bad, he said. Pretty sure the secret is to coat it in a metric ton of salt. He slapped it down onto a tortilla that looked slightly stale and handed it to Dickerson. The sergeant reluctantly took it, Guess I should enjoy this now, he conceded, since it's going to be a while before I have anything like this. That's the spirit, Jinx exclaimed. We work hard, we play hard, right? 
Dickerson took a bite of the food and nodded in surprise at the decent flavor. Well, just don't play too hard, he said after he swallowed, because the captain is going to be here within the hour. Is that your way of telling us to take it easy for a bit? Jinx asked as his friend gobbled down the rest of the taco. The sergeant shrugged, wiping his mouth. I do owe you one for earlier today, he admitted. We'll finish clearing it out. Just do me a favor, will you? Sure thing, the corporal replied, curling his hands behind his head comfortably. Save another one of these tacos for me, Dickerson said. I'll be back soon. Jinx raised a plastic cup filled with an unknown substance to his friend as he headed out the door. Everybody listen up, he said to his team. Each and every one of you did a hell of a job today. We keep this up, we might just live to see this thing through. He raised his cup high. On to Olympia. The others raised their own cups and bellowed. On to Olympia! The End Up next, Private Janie Watts finds herself trapped behind enemy lines when a mission to the north goes horribly wrong. In Seattle, Part 5